How much did gold sell for when you mined it? An ounce. How much it was worth? Yeah. Well, that was uh, twenty dollars and sixty cents. Ounce. An ounce. Yeah. But most of the gold only run around eighteen carat. Uh huh. Some of it only sixteen carat. Yeah. Yeah, I got. Did I show you that? Oh, I showed you that. Yeah. What's that? The piece of gold. Gold. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They say it's going to fifty-five dollars an ounce. Well, that isn't enough. It's got to go to a hundred and five. Why is that? Oh, the count of the commodities is too high. You know, everything's too high. Yeah. Uh huh. So uh, all the mines are shut down because they couldn't operate at a profit. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's why they're shut down. It's too expensive to mine gold. Yeah, nowadays. of course there's enough gold in the country by gosh to supply the whole god darn world. So far as that's concerned. Mm -hmm. But you got you got to keep it so you can make something. I don't want to work for nothing. I want to make something. Yeah. So therefore, the gold situation has got to go, unless they go back to, to 1914, and we all had sufficient money, happy, and made enough for lots to eat, and that was gold at $20 an ounce, and we paid three and a half a day to the man to work, and he put money in the bank every month, every month from the check. But now, even at 20 or 28, why, well, he couldn't put any money in the bank. So that's the condition, and the powder that I bought then was $2 for 50 pounds, and now it's $22. Yeah, and besides the taxes and all that you have to pay. Yes. <clears throat> <laughs> oh, the taxes, something terrible. Yeah. And the permit, the permits that you have to, you have to get permits, you know, they won't let you get any powder without permits and guarantees and taxes. Yeah. So, it, it's almost impossible now to, to run a mine at $35 an ounce. You couldn't, you couldn't make anything. Yeah. But at 105 you could. Yes, at 105 you can just get by. Yeah. That's the trend that everything is going. Uh -huh. Yeah. I sent, I sent a letter to Pettus, Pettus, our congressman. Mm -hmm. And I had a letter here that, that gave all of the taxes this, permits this, and all of this, and taxes, and income tax, and, and all, and laws, and bylaws, and all that, a whole god darn sheet of it. And make you laugh to read it. <laughs> <laughs> and laws, it says in laws and mother in laws. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I don't think uh, they, you've never seen Worth Bagley's tombstone. They've never seen no. where, he, where he died. Yeah, well, that's where his head laid there. Where, that's where he fell. Yeah, yeah, that's where his head laid there. Yeah. And you shot him? Huh? And you shot him? Yeah, I shot him. Oh, yeah. He took a shot at me and missed me, but I, I didn't miss. <laughs> but he was expert shot in the sheriff's field out there in Los Angeles. He was considered expert. That came out in the court. Yeah. He was expert shot, but this uh, stalker sheriff uh, got him to go in with him, and he was he was using Bagley to shove him ahead, using him. Uh -huh. See, <laughs> because he was a good shot, and he thought he'd get rid of me, and it was a arranged feud, uh -huh. arranged feud. They want to drive me out and take the range and my cattle and everything. So that that came about. But <clears throat> I had a, a dream several years before that of meeting Bagley in the road. And uh, he got out on one side of the car, and I got out on my side of the car, and we, we shot. That was just a dream. And then it faded away. But it came at the mill just exactly like that. Huh. Yeah. Came just that way. How far away was he when you shot? Fifty feet. Fifty feet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And it was because of water? Ma'am? It was because of the water? Then what? It was because of the water. The water? He would not Why let you have, an, you have any water. 
Now, why was he trying? To, why was he trying to shoot you? Well, he and Stalker had got in together, and if they could kill me off, why Redwine in Riverside would clear Bagley because he'd been an ex-deputy. He would clear him. It's already cut and dried between them. So he had no fear of shooting me according to law because he had it already fixed. So he came up there. He saw I was up at the mill and I was uh, pumping water for my cattle. And I got through and I drove on down and that was the county line there. And he had a little sign that little cardboard and he said, Keys, this is my last warning. Keep off my property. So I walked up a little ways, and that little bank there was eight feet higher than where I was. And I saw him coming from behind a Joshua tree down below, 50 feet away, with a gun in his hand, and he stepped over the log he had across the road like this. And he had the gun and his belt, I could all see that. So I went back to my car, and I pulled out the rifle. And I stood by my car, and I had the rifle down like this. And he came up on the rise, and he took a shot at me. Bang! And I up with this without aiming, and shot. And I took that knuckle out, and plowed a fur through his arm, and he jumped to the left like this. Or he turned around, and he was coming down like this. And I hit him twice in here. Mm -hmm. wow. so he was standing he, sideways, so he was hard yeah, to hit. Yeah, sideways, and he fell, and that gun scooped up a little sand, and it was cocked. He got down just this far when I shot him, and the, the doctor said he was dead when he hit the ground. It's a good shot. Mm-hmm, mm -hmm. yeah. Then what happened to you? Huh? Then what happened to you? Oh, they, they arrested me, or I went down to 29 Palms, and I didn't give myself up to the officer there, the constable, but I went to the judge's office, Judge Post, and I gave myself up there. And Mrs. Post came out and looked at my car, and when Bagley shot and I got through, and he was down, I looked at my radiator to see if he took my radiator. Well, I saw it wasn't leaking, so I didn't look any further, but Mrs. Post came out and looked at my car and found the bullet in the, in the door. That was the shot, the first yeah. shot that missed you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, of course, I was uh, taken in there then, and and there happened to be seven women on the jury, and they brought in several cases, six six cases of shooting, and those women said I was trigger happy. They'd give me a little hitch. Yeah. Yeah, I was trigger happy. They gave me a little hitch this time, they said. Because I'd been in court in Riverside before. <laughs> on the same kind of shooting, yeah. Really, is that true? Yeah, I, I shot a fellow by the name of Erton that lived in Banning. <laughs> cowboy. What did he do? Well, he was stealing my cattle, but that wasn't it. I shot him because he, he tarred and feathered an old lady at... Jost's Canyon, Bee Ranch. How come? And an old lady was homesteading there by the name of Woods. She was homesteading. And she had barley out in a field, and they, 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 this Erton came along as a cowboy for the cattlemen, and he cut the fence and let the cattle in there, and she shot four or five of them down, and shot them down. But they wouldn't try her because the case was, was against them. So they let that go, but they said, a half half breed Indian, Char uh, Harv Martin of Banning, they told him we're going to get even with her. Yeah, so the two brothers they went up there on the bank, and her ranch was over here, and her goat pen was here, and on this here's a, a, a wash, and on this bank they heated two tar, roof tar cans of tar before they heated it. I investigated that. And when they got that hot, she came out in the evening and she went out and she took one goat and brought it in and tied it. And then she thought the other goat should follow in, but they didn't. 
So she went out the second time and got another one. By that time, these fellows were standing back at the door. Back at the... And the goat, the reason the goats wouldn't come in because they were standing there. So when she went out and got another one and got, went into the house, into the shed, why well, they jumped in there and closed the door. So she was trapped in the house. Yeah, and uh, they, they stripped her clothes off. The underwear was laying there, and they poured the tar on her and feather. And then what did they do with her? Well, then her folks came on the first of the year. The first of the year, her folks. I could yeah. my mind. You already now? Yeah, well, uh, then uh, after asking these deputies to uh, do something, they wouldn't do it. And so when this Urton came along up to the mine where I was, and uh, he left word in Banning he was coming out here to put me in the hospital. And when he got out there, there were some women in his wagon. I went by here with a load of rails on up to the mine. And on the rocks, I saw the women, the calico dresses on the rocks. So they followed me up to the mine. And I was on loading rails when they drove up to my cabin. They drove up here and stopped. Well, Erton walked out here, and, and he was behind the bush, and the two girls went down to a tank. And I was down here on loading rails, and I heard that car. So I jumped off, and I grabbed my rifle out of the seat. And I walked up 106 feet up here, and he was behind a juniper then, and he was just emerging from behind that juniper, and I said, Is that you, Erton? And he said, That's me, and I shot. And I shot this arm and three ribs here, and he said, God Almighty. And he <laughs> went on, got into the car, and they went away. He did not die then. Yeah, and and the, and the jury tried tried that, and they got clear. Yeah. You were clear. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But you went to San Quentin for the other. For man. this other Bagley. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Because no other cause except he had been an officer of the law uh, in America. Here, an officer at the law, you must not shoot. Mm. Tell me about what it was like in San yeah, Quentin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's true. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> Regardless of what he does, do that's it. That's it. Don't shoot that's him. it. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. That doesn't make it a very even. Game. Exactly. By God, he could shoot me, but I must not shoot him. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's law. Yes, sir. Oh. You used to have a lot of cattle? Ma'am? You used to have a lot of cattle? Oh, yes, yes. I had a lot of cattle. I had 1,200. And this, uh, this stalker was trying to run cattle in here on my range. And the park service was so doggone small that they took my permit away from me and gave it to stalker because he bought 80 acres of land down here at Quail Springs. Or he traded an old car for the 80 acres to Headington. So he had land and they couldn't give anybody any permit unless they had owned land in the monument. So the Park Service said, we have given Stocker the, the, uh, the permit to run cattle. Well, that was totally against me, see. Totally against me. So this Stocker and his cowboy came along Quill Springs one day and I was down there bringing back some horses. And uh, they stopped, and he got off. He says, what are you doing here? He said, I have a notion to beat you up. Well, I said, if you have that notion, I says, don't, don't let that bother you. And he had a cowboy by the name of Caldwell sitting on the horse there. So he got off, and he pulled me off my horse. And in falling, I got this hand around his face like this in falling, and he happened to get his face into the sand. And I held him there, and then I straightened myself out like a lizard, and I tried to see if I could handle him, and I was his master. I could handle him. And he was breathing heavy. And, uh, and then I, I let go there after a while and reached around to get his gun. I'd have a little explosion under there if I could reach it, but a nerve in my arm had got hurt in the twist, and I couldn't, couldn't do it, couldn't use it. 
So I come back and I got my horse again and fastened. And then he says to his cowboy, Jay Caldwell, he says, come and get my gun, he's going to get it. So he jumped off and underneath there in the sand, he got the gun and went back to his horse. Then I said, Stocker, that isn't all. Now he says, uh, I said, I, I can't get your gun. I says, that's all right. But I says, I've got lots of sand here and I'll fill your mouth and your eyes and your ears full of sand. I'll choke you to death. So by that time he, he was wheezing and breathing heavy. And he had a star on him and he was a sheriff and a big man. But I was a lizard, <laughs> and I was holding him down, and uh, he was breathing heavy, and I was talking calm to him, and that bothered him. So he said, my God, man, he says, let me up. He says, I'll get out of here with my cattle, and I'll never bother you again. I'll never come back if you'll only let me up. I said, you heard that, Caldwell, and he's still living. Mr. Yeah. Caldwell. Is. Caldwell. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Jay Caldwell. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But he came back anyway, didn't he? No, no, never, never came did. back. But when I was still up in San Quentin, he sent two F deputies out here and told the missus he wanted to bury the hatchet. Oh, and he the wanted to be friends with you. Yeah, and, but, but the missus said, you're 15 years too late. And then I sent him word to come out, and we were talking over about this burying the hatchet. I wanted to shoot him. <laughs> I, wanted, yeah, I wanted to get him. I missed that, see? I miss that. Yes. Mm. He had it coming, you see, and, mm -hmm. and it should have been to my credit. <laughs> yeah. <coughs> uh, yeah. So this land was once very green with a lot of fruit, right? That, that which? This land was once very green with a lot of fruit trees and carrots. Oh, I had I a had hundred trees there. A hundred trees of fruit, different kinds of deciduous fruits and all the vegetables that we could use, and it was all a self-sustaining ranch. Mm -hmm. We had, had so much milk and milk products, and the meat, we can't 250 quarts a year, besides gunny sacks full of jerky hanging in the shed over there, always. And I had a lot of cattle here that could butcher any time, and had lots of meat on hand, and we had a teacher here, her name was uh, Lila Carlson, Lila Carlson, and she taught at Ludlow first. Then we got her to come over here because she had TB, and we fed her steak that you could cut with your fork and all the unsalted butter, cream, milk, and everything, and clabber milk, hot cakes, and sooty, and all of that kind of food, and all the fruit and vegetables that she could eat. And when she left here two years ago, she weighed 200. Oh, in goodness. ten years, she had no more TB, and she taught here ten years. She taught your children? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah, and there were a few others, you know, that were homesteading and some mining, and we had as many as nine. Did you ever see any Indians? Oh, yes, the Indians used to come here, yeah. They came here and they shot the sheep when I was stamping down there, grinding ore, and that noise brought the sheep there to see where that was. And the Indians come along from Coachella Valley and shoot them and load their ponies and go back. Did they ever talk to you, the Indians? Oh, yeah, yeah. The Indians were all the friendly. Mm-hmm, yeah. That was Adam and Eve when properly known. The red human. We have no history of him. But that's Adam and Eve. When this country was split by the Bering Strait, that left this, the Garden of Eden. Then who took care of this Indian? He had millions of buffalo. Who gave him the buffalo? The deer and everything. Corn, potatoes, and tomatoes. And all of that stuff that I'm mentioning never grew in Europe or Asia. And so we didn't take care of this Indian. Who did? It didn't matter where he moved. And if he moved there, it was like God giving bread and wine to his people. Well, something was provided for him there already. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. You once told me the story of Custer's Last Stand. Oh, Custer's Last Stand, yeah. Well, that, uh, <coughs> that, that started with me. That started down in Wichita, Kansas. Custer was a, a graduate from West Point, and he, he gained a great reputation in the Civil War. 
as a general. So when that then was over in 1963, well, then the government sent him out to Wichita, Kansas, to kill the Indians. He was a killer. So he went out there and he massacred the Indians. A lot of them? Oh, a lot of them, yeah. And uh, in, the, in the operation there, massacring these Indians, one of his generals brought, brought a little Indian girl, an Indian girl, uh, to Custer's tent. He said, here, Custer, here, General, I'll make you a present of this. Keep this. So uh, Custer kept this little girl. They had a tent there. And, and a, a year later, there was a boy born. And that uh, Custer being a blonde and uh, long hair and a blonde and this red girl, why, uh, that produced freckles in this little boy's face all over and they called him Rain in the Face. <laughs> the Indians immediately called him Rain in the Face. That was funny. Well, this boy grew up uh, to uh, be a man, and he became a general under Sitting Bull. A general, and that's when they were preparing to go to Little Bighorn for the big massacre. And that was years later, of course. Well, he, Custer went up the river, and Terry, Terry went up the river to Fort Lincoln. And he stopped there, and there's where they, was, they get the last orders. And Custer walked, went in, got his orders, and he walked out halfway out on the plank, and when he got halfway out, what Terry says, look here, Custer, don't kill them all, leave a few for me. And Custer turned around calmly and looked back and said, don't worry, General, I'll leave a plenty for you. Well, that was already on his brain, and he told the truth, foretold. So he went to South Dakota, and like a fool then, not knowing psychologically, he made a mistake right there. He hired Indian scouts to, to take him in. Well, that Indian scout, if, if, if properly known, that Indian, he wouldn't sacrifice his own people and kill his own people to, to help an enemy, a bitter enemy. No. So they just let him in the darndest trap that's ever made. Yeah. Yeah, all cut and dried by Indians. So he went in there, and on the river, that little bighorn there, they came down a ravine like this, and Custer was here, and another man here, and another one here, and another one here, horseback. And he had long hair, blonde, and he had buckskin fringe suit on, and the Indian knew that that was a marked man. And that Indian was submerged in the water with his head just sticking out of the willows on the edge of the river, and he shot Custer. Well, the truth of the matter is, the Indians said that, that all the white men went crazy, insane. They shot one another, and they hit one another, and there were thousands of Indians around, too, and they didn't know who they hit. And so, four o'clock in the evening, it was all over. And Rain in the Face walked down the hill, and his mother then was this little Indian girl. She was about to move the teepee back on the corner of the tide of the battle. And Ray in the face says, Mother, do not move the teepee. He says, we've killed them all. Killed them all. Which meant her husband, too. Yeah. Where does Curly the Crow come in? Like, according to, according to the government's <laughs> history. There was no Curly the Crow. So then he says, men to his men, he says, get your tummy hawks and your clubs and go out there. If any white man leaning down there, dying and bleeding, knock them all in the head. And he says, bring your knives and we'll cut up all these fat horses and we'll have a feast tonight. And cut up enough meat and come pack your ponies in the morning and we'll go home. And they marched by Reno the next morning, 9,000 Indians, and there wasn't a shot fired. By Reno, Nevada? Eh? By Reno? Did he say by Reno? No, where the... Uh... Reno. Reno. General, uh, General Major Reno. Reno. Oh. The soldiers were all dead. Major Reno. Oh. Major Reno was jealous of Custer. He wanted the glory. And so did Yates wanted the glory. And so others wanted that glory. And none of them would help him for that reason. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, you see, it was a... <coughs> How did the story get wrong? Well, because the government may have to make a, a history. A military history, and they picked Cully the Crow that was half Indian and half nigger. Uh -huh. Well, he was a hundred miles from there, come to find out. Uh -huh. Yeah. 
as history will tell it, uh, he was 100 miles away from there, he wasn't there at all. And right in the face says, Mother, we've killed them all. Well, that's 224 killed right on that hill there. Now, I heard it cattle there for Hubbard, Holdridge, and Farrier. They were cattle kings and they were railroad kings. And I heard it cattle there, and the Indians, the young Indians came in every year to worship their dead, and there was hundreds of them killed there. Yeah. <clears throat> so that, the Indians call that valley Greasy Grass Valley, because in the morning, in the sun, the first sun come up, it shined like diamonds. Really? The grass. They called it Greasy Grass Valley. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They knew all about Greece. There were there were a lot of nice people. The Indians came in. Of course, they were educated. The young Indians, they were already educated, and they were very nice to tell all about what the ancestors had told them. And they had that true history, because there was no survivors of white men. No, to tell none. The story. None, no. Yeah. <clears throat> Well, that must have been a sight, if a person could have witnessed that. That must have been a sight of confusion. It's just a round knoll hill. It's not a, not a big hill. It's just a high plateau-like. Mm -hmm. And uh, these Indians were already he had already surrounded there. When Custer came down a ravine, they lost three boxes up here, and they sent a man back with a wagon to go back and pick up the boxes. And when they got up there, there was three naked, naked Indians there and had opened the boxes. They thought it was ammunition, but it was hard tack. <laughs> Crackers. Yeah, 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 yeah. They were already surrounded, Chief. If properly understood, this is all separate grade from this irrigation that they couldn't find vehicles by gosh to haul it. And that was a project since 1917. All that work has been preparing to irrigate the steps. We know what the steps are over there. Yeah. You said something about never electing a fighting man to be a president? Ne never elect a military man or a man that's been military taught or a general of any kind, because that's on his brain. You can't change that. No, you can't change that. He'll go along that line. And that's what we've got now, this uh, Eisenhower. Well, this Johnson, I don't know about that. <laughs> yeah. Do you read what but, Bobby Kennedy's going to run against him? Uh, Kennedy is making a, a great talk, but I didn't like the first Kennedy, and I don't like the second one. Because they were men that had too doggone much money. Mm -hmm. They had too much money, and they wouldn't be for you. Uh, oh no! Oh no! <laughs> you, you didn't like you, you didn't like Kennedy very much as president. No, I didn't. Uh, because I'll tell you why. He was Catholic. Well, religions are all nothing. Nothing. See, it's all. A wishful thinking, that whole doggone writing is all a wishful thinking. And they've held the people for 2,000 years on nothing, on nothing. You can die a million deaths, you know, there's no God ever made that will ever help you and there never will be. We are all on this earth to take, take care of ourselves. And we are all within the mammal family all around, within the mammal family. And we are no other. <laughs> no. no. Then, then you don't consider yourself a religious man. <laughs> Me? <laughs> Not in, in Christianity, no. No, oh no. I don't believe a word of it. What do the Indians believe? Well, the Indians have a belief of the sun and the moon and the stars. They have a belief there is a, a mysterious uh, being or a spirit, a mysterious spirit. 
But you might take the fastest machine that's made today and you could travel for a million miles and you'd just still be in space. All of this earth is a crystal. Every piece of, with a microscope, you take and examine that, and every speck on this earth is a crystal. And when you take this in consideration, all these valleys, and when they were up on top of the mountain, they would be thousands and thousands of feet, and maybe 50,000 or 75,000 feet higher. This earth one time was nothing but crevices, mountains, and gorges. That's all there was. There wasn't any land. This land has all been made from the mountains since then, and these valleys have all been made. And if you take all this alluvial soil, these valleys, and put them up on top, how high would they be? <laughs> <laughs> Where do you think these big rocks came from? These big rocks were solidified from gas. Gas solidified. It was gas like these clouds making this gas mix, and it makes a star or a moon, or a sun, every day, every day, yeah, there's one of them made. This gas finally it solidifies into stone, yeah, and this hot, and then for some reason or another, it solidifies into stone, and with the pressure, it, it's hot in the middle. In the middle, it's a molten mass now, and it comes up now, it used to come up in volcanoes, come up through and build mountains and all that. But now when we have an earthquake, it's in, in the deepest part of the ocean where the crust is the thinnest yet around this earth. And it'll find the weakest place and it'll, it'll, it'll shoot out there and then the water come in there'll be a big explosion and our earth will tremble. Yeah. But nothing coming to the surface. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And the rocks never move, do they? Never move. No, no, no. Not even an earthquake do they fall? Not, a, not, not even an earthquake. No, this earth goes around so fast, and you take anything whirling fast, it draws everything in. Draws everything in. In Banning, there was a street like this and one like this, and they were racing to Phoenix from Los Angeles with automobiles in 1912. And I was standing on this corner... And this, this street was a little bit lower than this one. There was a little dip there. And those automobiles were going so fast they would jump from this side to this side without touching the bottom. And when they got on this side, there was a little dog ran out. And uh, the fast going struck that dog under and rolled him for 40 feet. And he was covered with mud, dust and dust. They had to take him up, <laughs> clean him. <laughs> and just, yeah. Well, now I see what gravity, what that... Uh, that pull is what that pull is. Even that automobile pulled that dog in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How and did you feel the first time you discovered gold? The first time, well, the first gold was discovered. I don't know who, whether these Indians did or not, but the first gold was even in Christ's day. Gold was the thing, yeah. So... When these, did you first discover gold? These Indians, these Indians knew what gold was, and they mined it. The Inca in South America mined gold in a raster like that over there, and they had little llama. The little llama went around for power. The little llama is like a camel, a yes. little bit like a camel. They used that for power, and they had gold, and when Cortez came over here, why, well, he he came out on horses from the ship onto the land, and the Indians thought that was one, riding a horse, you know, a man and a horse. They thought that was one. And when he dismounted, why, well, they were amazed. It was two. Yeah. So he, he came out, and he, they rode, they rode these Indians on the back. The Indians had to carry them. They, they, they talk about uh, savage Indians. No, they were not savage. It was the, the Spanish were savage. They, 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 they made these Indians pack them over the mountains. Yeah. And they, they rode women and all. They ride them. The women had to carry them and do all of that. And the way they treated them was like a beast. So in the end, then, with the Inca, he built a fire under the chief's feet 
uh, to make him tell where the gold was. A little fire under there. Uh, you either tell me they'll burn you up. Yeah. So that was the Spanish. They're very cruel. <coughs> very cruel. Yeah, the Spanish have always been According very to history. Cruel. Yeah. Yeah, according to history. They were very bad there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There was no end to cruelty. Yeah. Those Indians, they had a religion, and they were astronomers, and they were on the road of civilization in their own way. Yeah, the Inca, they did cultivate corn and <clears throat> pumpkin, squash, summer squash, and everything else, tomatoes and potatoes and fruits of all kinds. They grew that in the Inca Empire. And the history says that the Incas built their empire out of maize, corn, corn, built an empire. Yeah. Did yeah. a wagon train ever come through here? Huh? Did a wagon train ever come through here? Wagon trains? Mm -hmm. Well, we had wagon trains in 19, uh, in 1909, 1910, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, we got our first car. Yeah, Model T. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and before that, we went to San Bernardini and these wagons are standing here, back and forth. How long did it take you to go? Oh, we here? stayed uh, lots of time, two weeks. We'd stop in every town, take in all the theaters and the, uh, the, all the excitements, <laughs> then go to San Bernardino and coming back. That was our vacation. Vacation. Did you yeah. ever go to Los Angeles? How, how oh, far? Oh, yes, we used to go to Los Angeles on the train from Banning. How mm -hmm. far is. Uh, uh, where, did, where, where was that town you went on the wagons? Banning. San Bernardino. How, yeah, how far is San Bernardino from, well, from your ranch, right here? That's, uh, that's probably 75 miles. 75 yeah. Miles. One way. Yeah. Yeah. So we had to go there. Most of uh, Redlands was only a little way station. The old store was there, yet where the two fellows that used to be here held up the store there, and loaded up all the, a four-horse load of groceries and drove out. And a fellow by the name of Chestnut was picked up at Cabazon with that four-horse team and that load of groceries, bringing it here to these outlaws. And the other one was Charlie Marshall. He went up in the Big Bear in Big Meadow, and he was in a cabin, and, and Sheriff Robertson then came along and trailed him. And when he ran across the meadow to go across where his horse was, they shot him. They hit him. They hit him in the arm. But they didn't get him. He got on his horse and got out here. Yeah. And then he, uh, after he got out here, why well, he told Jim McCaney, he says, Jim, <clears throat> when I come back, I'm going to San Jacinto. But when I come back, things between you and I will be a horse of another color. He said. But he went to San Jacinto and shot two men, and he had to go to penitentiary. <laughs> Yeah, that settled that. That settled that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Did your wife like the life out here? Oh, yeah. She used to be telegraph operator. And she liked to, she said she liked to go out in the desert, in the desert sand, the rocks in the desert sand. She made a poem. I've got the poem in there. And she did come out here, and she liked it here. Yeah. You told she me wrote, she used to catch bees? Yeah, she rode horseback and she became a bee hunter. She could, now, this, now, this afternoon, she'd hunt bees and she would, with, with the wings like that in the sun there, you could see them through that gap. And she'd go up there where she saw the last wings and then she'd stand there and watch. Then we had to go down on the other side and they went around like that. Well, that's where the beehive is. <laughs> so you had plenty of honey. Oh, yeah, yeah. All the honey we could use. We had lots of it went to sugar. Yeah. It went to sugar. <clears throat> yeah. <clears throat> so the life here was, was the natural life in the earth. We were self-sustaining. We raised everything. We didn't have to buy anything. I bought only machinery, horses and mules and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> and my girls all became hoist engineers, and I built these dams with a cable running up, and the kids would hoist the stuff up to me. 
and uh, Virgie became a pretty good cowgirl. She could, she could rope pretty well and brand. Really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, then, during that last war, why, the government sent her back to uh, Bethesda, Maryland, to study as a technician in that hospital there. Well, she graduated there and went to Wisconsin and run a place up there for a while. Then she came out here to, to Oceanside and stayed there a while. And then she came out to 29 Palms to that base out there to teach and got married, and that's the end. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. You used to make them cards and valentines and prison? Oh, yes, 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 yeah. Yeah. We had to make everything here. We had to make everything. Yeah. And we, we pulled the feathers or the, the feathers off the geese and ducks that we shot to make our pillars. <laughs> yeah. What year did you get here, Mr. Keyes? Huh? What year? What? Well, November 1909. I came here when Willie Boy was out that month. And Willie Boy came out from Banning. He shot a fella there in Banning. They took the girl and came on around. And he shoot jackrabbits to eat. That's all they had. And he got up there at Chiparosa Springs back there by back of Pioneer Town. And, uh, well, he was running short of ammunition and uh, had no grub. And he had to go to 29 Palms to try to get a gun and more ammunition. So uh, this girl was sitting there by the fire, and he shot her in the back. Yeah, killed her. So he left her lay there, and he went to 29 Palms. And Well, the women at 29 Palms took the gun, hearing about this. They took the gun and the ammunition, they threw it in the pool. The cattle watering pool there was walled up uh, four or five feet deep, and they threw the guns and the ammunition in there. And Willie Boy came along, and he couldn't get any ammunition or gun. And I was hauling ore from a mine beyond the marine base there in the, uh, in the Bullion Mountain, or just east of Bullion Mountain. And I had a pretty good road running across there. I had a wagon and team running across there, milling at 29 palms. So Willie Boy followed my tracks over there, and he camped in my camp one night. Then the next day went to Spry Springs and on down to Stone Corral, and that's when the posse mess met him over there. And uh, they were in the wash one night, and the posse was down here, the two counties, and uh, one of the deputies says, keep the fire low so Willie Boy can't see us. Keep it low, yeah. But Willie Boy was laying up on the bank, 50 feet up there, with his ear down there listening. And Charlie Ritchie says, just show me an Indian in the morning, and I'll show you how to treat an Indian. Yeah. He says, I know all about Indians. Well, the next day, Willie Boy shot him. Shot him through here, knocked him off the horse, and he lay in the ravine there in the hot sun all afternoon. And Willie Boy was walking up the hill, and he says, Come on up, boys, bring me a cigarette. Well, they, they, they wouldn't go up. They went back. And they didn't come back till night to pick up Richie. He had to lay there in the sun all afternoon. So they picked him up and took him on out. Then they were gone for two weeks, recuperating, re-reforming both counties. Then they came out, they had Indian trackers, and they came up, and they tracked Willie Boy where he said, bring me some cigarettes, boys. And they came up here, and they went around a rock, and he shot himself with the only shell they had left. Only one, one bullet. He shot himself, he lay there behind a rock, and the Krivikoy was head. Deputy, he came around the rock, he was leading the posse, coming around, and he saw Willie Boy's feet and he shot him. Well, he was well swelled up as big as a barrel. He only let the gas out of him. <laughs> never written, he never written. <laughs>